I know you're anxious to hear from Pastor David again, as I am. Uh, he's been gone doing some rest and recovery, and uh, Connie and I were gone for a couple of weeks, but um, before we left, um, I asked him if I could preach today, and um, but he will be back in the saddle next week. Uh, God gave me this message years ago, and when I was in my first pastorate, and uh, we had a, one of our teenage girls got pregnant, and I heard somebody say, well, she can't go to the youth class anymore, and she can't sing in the choir anymore, and she was heavy burdened with her own guilt. She didn't, she didn't need all of this uh, negativism. Um, and I, I prayed, God, how, how am I supposed to deal with this? And he led me to the scripture in John chapter 8, where the lady that had been caught in adultery was brought to Jesus. And I read it and I studied it. And God gave me insights to what was happening in those verses of Scripture. So I, after that, I went to the girl's home and I sat down with her in her living room and talked with her and her parents were sitting there listening at the kitchen table. And, um, and I read this, these verses of Scripture to her and explained to her what I will share with you today. And she continued in that youth class and she continued to sing in the choir just like I encouraged her to do and I told her I said if anybody says anything to you you let me know and I'll deal with it the next Sunday her parents were in church and they had not been attending but they the message that I shared with them was a message of love and forgiveness and well I'll get into all of that a little later but God led me to put it on my heart to bring this message today and I thank Pastor David for allowing me to do this in um, Jesus is dealing with this situation. Um, let this scripture's already been shared. Let he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. It's one thing to hear with your outer ear, and you hear me. It's another thing to hear with your inner ear, where the Spirit speaks. And what he says is far greater than what I share. But he takes what I share and he fits it where it belongs. Pastor leaving the church after service one Sunday, preacher, you preached right to me. Another one said, preacher, you preached right to me. He says, well, I don't go up there with a rifle. I go up with a shotgun. And whoever it hits, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and uh, man, the Bible tells us man in his own natural abilities cannot comprehend or receive the things of God, the things of the Spirit, because they are spiritually discerned. And Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come and he will teach you. And he will guide you into all truth. And God gives us his Holy Spirit to dwell within us to do just that. He comes to teach us. And in teaching us, he leads us to the truth. That truth that Jesus said, if we continue in, we will be free. He, he renews our life. 
as he renews, transforms our life as he renews our mind. And so we need to be sensitive to what the Spirit says to us. Now, let's look at John chapter 8. Jesus went into the mount to pray. He went to the Mount of Olives. That's what it says. But this was his regular place to go and pray. To be alone with the Father. Because he took it very seriously. And he said it many times. I come not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And it was times in prayer that he understood what God's will, the Father's will was for him. And it's important for us to do the same. So Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Now what do you say? It says this they said, tempting him, that they might have a place to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote with his finger on the ground as though he didn't hear them. And we all would like to know what Jesus wrote in that ground. I personally believe he was writing out some sins. And we'll, we'll get back to that in a few minutes. But I want to first talk about the law. Um, the law dash flesh and grace dash spirit. Because there is a difference. And people, sinners who are under the law, first of all, are condemned because they are children of disobedience they're deserving of the judgment of God because they have sinned against him by being disobedient to him now the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death and Jesus died to pay the wages of our sin and if we put our faith and trust in him and what he did and what he's going to do, what he's doing today, then we are forgiven. The penalty has been paid in full. They said the law says she should be stoned. That's sin under the law. But sin under grace tells us that there's a way out. We don't have to suffer death for our sin. Yes, we're going to die physically unless the Lord comes. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, he could do that right now and uh, get us out of this crazy world. But, um, but you see, there's a second death. The Bible speaks of a second death. Physical death is a first death, but a spiritual death, a death that comes after the great white throne judgment when people are thrown in that lake of fire that burneth forever and ever. That is a second death, and it is an eternal death. And we don't have to go there because what God has done for us. But we're told in John chapter 1 that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And in that, in that verse, you see two different testaments or two different covenants. Those under the law and those that are under grace. And 
no man ever could fulfill the law. And God gave us grace. He gave us a way out. Grace is unmerited and undeserved favor. It is a gift God gives us. We don't earn it. Now, let's look at the scribes and the Pharisees. Let's look at the characteristics of these people. Number one, they were legalistic. And what does that mean? It means they were strict and literal adherence to the letter of the law. But listen to this. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. God has made us able ministers of the New Testament. There it is, the New Testament, not the old, not the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And that's what's going to take place in these verses of Scripture. The scribes and Pharisees says, death, the letter kills Jesus is saying grace, forgiveness. So the, the, these scribes and Pharisees are legalistic. But you know, six times in the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, you have heard it said, you know, this is what the scribes and Pharisees are telling you. This is the letter of the law. But I'm saying to you is grace. I'm talking about a new covenant, a new testament between God and mankind. That's what he was saying. He was revealing the spirit of the law. So the, the scribes and Pharisees are legalistic. Also, they are dogmatic. What does that mean? Arrogant, self-righteous in nature, puffed up in pride. They were guilty of seeing the moat in others' eyes, but not able to see the beam in their own eye. And they tried to correct others when they needed correcting themselves. Now, judgment. They were judgmental, legalistic, dogmatic, judgmental. That means they were expressing accusations and sentencing. And what was their approach? What was their motive? They were tempting Jesus. They wanted to catch him in something so that they could accuse him. And when they started this, Jesus just stooped down and he started writing in the, on the ground in the sand, as I said earlier. And then it tells us, they continued asking him. They were persistent. They weren't going to let him off the hook. And when they continued, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. And again, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground. This is the way Jesus dealt with them. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. So what was the impact of Jesus' words? They which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. At the words of Jesus, they were convicted by their own conscience. You see, conviction is a work of the Holy Spirit. When the Word of God goes forth, it doesn't go out there all by itself. It goes out with the Holy Spirit behind it, and the Holy Spirit operating within it. That's why when God said, let there be light, there was light. 
when Jesus spoke to the storm, peace be still. The storm just calmed right down. Because God's word, we're told in the Old Testament there, Isaiah, I believe, his word will not return in the void. It will accomplish that for which he sends it and that which pleases him. And so when Jesus shared those words, they were convicted in their own heart. And they walked away. But you see, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody. There's none righteous, no, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to our own way. But God laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. And he paid the wages of our sin. And his last words are, it is finished. It was paid in full. So, then Jesus approached to the woman. After the scribes and Pharisees have walked away, Jesus lifted himself up and saw none but the woman. And he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. You see, God sent Jesus. Jesus, uh, <clears throat> he didn't condemn the woman. She was wrong in what she did, but he didn't condemn her. The Bible tells us that in John chapter 3, 17, that Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So what was Jesus' approach? How did he approach this woman? Number one, he approached her in love. That means... Benevolent, kind, caring, compassion. Scriptures tell us that Jesus was often moved with compassion as he saw the needs of the people. And I'm glad today that God looks beyond our faults to see our need. He looked beyond the fault of this woman and saw her need. She needed to be reconciled. To God. She needed to be delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the, the kingdom of light. He was loving. He was understanding. He was comprehending and knowing. Full details. You see, the Bible tells us man looks on outward things, but God looks on the heart. And that's why God can look beyond our faults to see our need. Because he looks at our heart. He was loving. Jesus was understanding. But he was also forgiving. Often when Jesus was healing somebody, he would say, your sins are forgiven. The scribes and Pharisees say, no man can forgive sins but God. They didn't know that he was standing out there before them. And if you remember, after he said that, Jesus says, what's easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to tell this man who's been crippled all these years to rise up and walk? And with that, he reached over and he says, sons, rise up and walk. And the man got up and walked. He took up his mat and he walked out the door. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. They didn't think that Jesus was going to do that. And no matter how they came at Jesus, they couldn't overcome him. He was loving, understanding, and forgiving. 
he was exhorting that to this woman he exhorted her in these words neither do I condemn you go and sin no more he was exhorting her telling her instructing her now you go and don't sin no more he was redemptive in his relationship with this woman redeeming her restoring her offering her pardon can you imagine put yourself in her place here the scribes and Pharisees have brought her and said this is what the law says she was caught in the very act of adultery and it says she should be stoned She's probably wondering how many more moments she's got to live until Jesus stood up. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He was reconciling this woman unto God. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. The ministry of Jesus was a reconciliation, reconciling people to God, not imputing their trespasses to them. And in this time, we... We all need to understand, first of all, there's a little bit, a certain amount of the spirit of scribes and Pharisees in all of us. We refer to that as the flesh. And we can walk that way. But we don't have to. We can walk in the spirit. And in the spirit, we become like Jesus. We love to to look at that scripture and quote that scripture. God works all things for good to them that love God who are called according to his purpose. And we take it totally out of context we must remember that within the context, God tells us what his purpose is. It's that we be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That we become like him. And as we become like him, then we're going to act like he acts. We're not going to walk in the flesh. We're going to walk in the spirit. We're not going to walk in the letter of the law that kills, but we're going to walk in the spirit of the law that's life. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Because they weren't the letter, they were the spirit of the law. And they were spoken in the spirit and not in the flesh. So where will we stand? That young lady I mentioned earlier that got pregnant, she continued to go into that youth class. And I told some of those adults, I said, you want to take her out of that class, but God wants to use her to speak to the rest of those youth as she did she shared her hurt over her sin and what it had done to her what it had done to her family and they were encouraged not to follow in her footsteps and They, the thing is, is that God allows us to go through things in our life 
so that we will know what it's like, so that we can reach out to others who are going through the same thing and share in their hurt and, and do that, that restoration and bring them to God for whatever it is that they need. And I pray that we in our own life will be more like Jesus and less like the scribes and Pharisees. We will walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, it is with thankful hearts that we come before you today. Lord, you have blessed us with so much. You have blessed us with your word which is truth. Your Holy Spirit teaches it to us and guides us into the application of it in our own life. You have sent the Holy Spirit not only to be the communicator, revealer of your word, but also the enabler who helps us to live in accordance with your word. Lord, I pray that this message today would be received and let it apply where it needs to be applied. May it bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.